right, everyone. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Extra Manning. Um, today, I'll be presenting on the base of thumb trauma. So, just as a background, the thumb provides uh, a lot of hand function, and total disability of it uh, results in significant um, lack of functional ability for the patient, and up to loss of 22% of their bodily function. The CMC joint is a quite a complex joint. It's a biconcave, convex, saddle-shaped joint, which allows motion in multiple degrees of. Uh, um, uh, freedom uh, and the axis of the metacarpal was actually pronated and flexed at 80 degrees relative to the other metacarpals to allow for opposition. Uh, today the article that I'm mainly drawing a lot of my information from is this article from the, the Journal of Hand Surgery in 2009 which is a nice overview of uh, base of thumb trauma and highly cited. Just a, a bit of background about the imaging uh, before I move into the specific conditions. Uh, the X-rays that are most pertinent uh, for base of thumb trauma include a Roberts view, which is a true AP, where the dorsum of the thumb is placed directly on the X-ray cassette. And you can get a Kapanji PA view, which is in the top right there, which is uh, where the thumb is placed on an object and it uh, shoots through to get a better view of the base of thumb and CMC joint. And, and then the true lateral, which is the Betts view, where the uh, lateral aspect of the thumb is placed directly on the cassette with the hand pronated. And then the bleak view can assist with um, uh, viewing dislocations a bit better as well. In terms of uh, uh, fractures, they're the most common in young people and elderly people, a sort of a, a bimodal distribution. And they can be classified as either extra-articular, partial art intra-articular, which is the Bennett fracture, a complete intra-articular, which is a Rolando fracture, and then also a severely comminuted fracture, which I won't be uh, specifically talking about today in much detail. There are three muscles that you can see on the right-hand side there that are the main deforming forces at the base of the thumb when there's fractures, those being adductor pollicis, abductor pollicis longus, and extensor pollicis longus. Moving on to extra-articular fractures, the most common extra-articular fracture is the one at the, the metadiaphyseal junction, which is called an epibasal fracture. And because of the pull of the, the, the muscles, um, the adductor pollicis, the FPL, and the abductor pollicis brevis, on that distal fragment, you get this dorsal angulation uh, with the apex angling dorsally. And this, the amount of angulation can be accepted anywhere up to 30 degrees. Um, if you allow for malunion at any more than 30 degrees, then it ends up in compensatory metacarpal phalangeal joint hyperextension, um, which can lead to pain and reduced function. In terms of uh, managing these, they can be managed mostly with closed reduction, so tractioning, extending the thumb, and pronating the thumb around with direct pressure over that apex dorsal fragment or apex dorsal angular uh, component, uh, and then splint it in a position um, where the, the thumb is closed reduced uh, with a cast. Uh, otherwise, if the if the close reduction is inadequate, then it can you can proceed to either uh, uh, open reduction or with percutaneous fixation or um, internal fixation. The Bennett fracture is was originally described by E. H. Bennett in eighteen eighty two, and it specifies or it's related to a specific intraarticular two part fracture where you get a volar ulnar fragment, as can be seen in this image on the right hand side. This fragment is still attached to the anterior oblique ligament, which is previously called the beak ligament, which uh, its other attachment is onto the trapezium. The mechanism of injury is from an axial load on a partially flexed thumb, uh, and it can be consistent with other injuries such as ulnar collateral ligament and trapezium fractures. And in terms of, you, you don't get a great view on this x-ray, but you'll see other x-rays um, surely, but the metacarpal shaft can sublux dorsally, uh, proximally, and radially. So in terms of the types of Bennett fractures, there's a Geta classification. Um, so one type one on the far left there, where you've got a single uh, ulnar fragment with subluxation of the metacarpal base. Uh, that's where it goes dorsal, proximal, radial. Uh, type two is the impaction fracture without subluxation. And then type three is where you get a small ulnar revulsion with a complete CMC dislocation. In terms of management of these, uh, you can do closed reduction, so that involves axial traction, uh, abduction and pronation with pressure over the base of the metacarpal, and that is using ligamentotaxis to reduce the fracture. Uh, however, if you're going to be managing these fractures, they're actually better managed with closed reduction and then internal fixation, as there's been shown to be poor outcomes uh, with casting alone after closed reduction. 
So if you are going to fix these, uh, then moving on to either intermetacarpal fixation with K wires uh, to the second metacarpal or the, and or the trapezium. And you can also add another wire through that volar ulnar fragment to stabilize it if required if, and if it's big enough. Uh, if there's more than one to two millimeters of displacement or intra-articular step, then the thought is to open, reduce and fix. However, this is controversial and the evidence has shown uh, good and bad outcomes for both open reduction and closed reduction when there is one to two millimeters of displacement. If the fragments are too small or um, too comminuted to fix or reduce, then you can consider either traction pinning, so distraction, and external fixation um, to, to hold those out to length and allow it to unite. In terms of the approach to the base of thumb fractures, the most commonly described one is the Wagner approach, which is a, a um, incision over the radial margin of the thenar eminence, uh, and that gives good, uh, good um, visualization to the base of thumb to allow for fixation uh, in open reduction um, if required. Moving on to the Rolando fractures. So these were described by uh, Silvio Rolando in 1910, specifically relating to a Y or a T-shaped three-part intra-articular fracture. Uh, so you get the same volar ulnar fragment attached to that um, anterior oblique ligament and then a dorsal radial fragment as well. These have a worse prognosis than um, other base of thumb fractures with over 50% of them uh, leading to carpometacarpal osteoarthritis from this study in 1991. And, they can be managed with closed reduction internal fixation if it's a simple three-part fracture with less than one millimeter of displacement, but usually these are relatively displaced and can be quite comminuted, and so a lot of them require open reduction internal fixation. Uh, and if they're, again, if the fragments are too small to fix or they're highly comminuted, then distraction and um, uh, traction pinning or external fixation can be more appropriate in some circumstances. This is uh, some images of some fixation methods for Orlando fractures. So on the top, top left is an a, um, external fixation with stabilisation to the second metacarpal. And the top right is just some AO pictures of some KYs being put in, to, in an attempt to reconstruct the fracture. And then you can also use um, an open reduction technique with uh, plates and screws to, as, as seen in the bottom left there, or uh, just multiple KYs as seen in the bottom right. Moving on to first CMC joint dislocation. This is a rare thumb injury, so it accounts for less than 1% of thumb injuries. And the, uh, yeah, the, uh, the way it dislocates is mostly dorsal, but there have been volar dislocations that have been mentioned in case reports only. Uh, it's generally due to an axial force on the flexed thumb again, or it can also be from a dorsal force through the first web space. So say someone's on a bike, and, and hold the handlebars and then their body continues to go forward and there's a dorsal force applied through the first web space. Uh, they usually present as pain, swelling and bruising of a thin eminence and they're unable to form a fist. And sometimes the deformity can be quite, quite subtle and this can be missed um, if uh, inappropriate or insufficient x-rays are done. In terms of the ligamentous stability or the stability of the base of the thumb or the first CMC joint, there are 16 ligaments which stabilize it, but I've listed the four most important here, of which the top two are the most important. So the dorsoradial ligament, which is the, the one that stops radial subluxation, and then the anterior oblique ligament, which is that one that's attached to those um, volar ulnar fragments of the Bennett's and Rolando fractures. And in terms of investigating, standard radiographs are usually sufficient, as can be seen on the bottom right. And, and then MRI is often used to guide ligament reconstruction and tell you which sort of ligaments are involved and which would benefit from uh, reconstruction um, from different types of dislocations in, um, in patients that have recurrent or persistent instability after the thumb is reduced. In terms of management, uh, a lot of these can be managed uh, with closed reduction and immobilization with a thumb in extension and pronation, which is the position of safety. And the the Definitive management or the, the choice to use this as a definitive management should only be if the thumb is stable on reduction. So whether it's reduced in the emergency department or in theatre, if it is stable, then it's not re-dislocating easily, then that's the, the best way to manage them. If it is more unstable, uh, then percutaneous pinning can be, um, can be performed as well. And this is actually the recommended treatment. And however, the, just due to the numbers of these injuries that occur and the, the relatively um, uh, sparse or sparse literature on the condition, uh, there's no real consensus on the management of these. It's just that some people would say that this is a recommended treatment. And 
adding a like a, an open ligamentous re reconstruction, so a capsular re ligamentous reconstruction, um, as is described in this 1996 article, where they used an FCR autograft and then a, a, a percutaneous pinning as well, was shown to lead to better pinch and abduction thumb strength and better range of motion and lower pain compared to patients that were managed with closed reduction and percutaneous, percutaneous pinning only. So there is um, thought that a, a soft tissue reconstruction can aid in the, the functional outcome for patients. However, there have been other studies that have shown otherwise, and so it is quite controversial. Uh, despite whatever management that's taken, there is a, a relatively low incidence of recurrent dislocation that's described in the literature. So just with that uh, study by Simone and uh, the in improvements in the strength is approximately 90% return in, in strength uh, if you do the ligamentous reconstruction and approximately 80% return with, uh, without the ligamentous reconstruction. This is a quite a zoomed in picture and I've tried to sort of label a few things and it's cut off the L for dorsal. But uh, this is, we're looking at the left hand from the back with the wrist um, on the right hand side, the dorsal aspect of the wrist. And then you can actually see the first metacarpal, which I've labeled sort of towards the top left of the image. The two black lines in the middle point to the dorsoradial ligament, which has been avulsed or torn in this, um, in this circumstance from a CMC dislocation. And then the joint capsule in the middle of the image as well, uh, which has been completely torn in a sort of a transverse fashion, which is exposing the base of the first metacarpal. So this is a very unstable um, CMC dislocation where this reconstruction would be um, beneficial for the patient. Uh, moving on to ulnar collateral ligament injuries, um, the thumb is normally stable throughout the flexion extension range of motion and throughout its full arc. This is opposed to the finger MCP joints that are generally uh, stable in flexion and lax in extension. And the range of motion is extremely variable in the thumb and so even in the same patient when you're comparing side to side there can be significant differences in the range of motion. And the ulnar collateral ligament, or both ligaments, we're specifically talking about the UCL, um, consists of a proper collateral ligament, which is taut in flexion, and then that attaches from the lateral condyle of the metacarpal to the proximal phalanx, and then the accessory collateral ligament, which is taut in extension, and that attaches from the volar aspect of the metacarpal to the sesamoids and the volar plate. There's also some dynamic stability provided by the muscles about the thumb, so the adductor pollicis, the flexor pollicis brevis, and the extensor pollicis brevis. In terms of the way these are injured, there, there can be acute injuries and chronic injuries. So the acute injury, uh, also called skier's thumb, is usually uh, a distal avulsion of the ulnar collateral ligament, and it can be associated with a proximal phalanx fracture in up to 50% of patients. And this was thought to be originally described as from uh, patients holding ski poles and then having their thumb extended and abducted when it's been caught and dragged back. Uh, and then the chronic injury is the gamekeeper's thumb, which is traditionally due to the way that the Scottish gamekeepers would break the necks of the rabbits between their thumb and index finger. Uh, moving on to the physical exam. Uh, so this can be very important in differentiating complete from partial tears, but it's often very difficult in patients to do acutely because of the pain and muscle spasm. Uh, however, it can be done under a median and radial nerve block in clinic and, or in theatre um, under II as well. So a, a joint is considered, or the MCP joint is considered unstable if it's got more than 35 degrees of joint angulation on the valgus stress when it's flexed and, or extended. And if it's uh, done with the thumb flexed, then you can say that it's a, a complete proper collateral ligament tear if there's got greater than 35 degrees of angulation. And then with the thumb extended, it's, uh, it would be an accessory collateral ligament uh, tear if there was that angulation. You can see in the top right uh, the representation of how that angulation is measured. And the other definitions of uh, instability are a greater than 20 degree variation in the valgus angulation from side to side, so accounting for some um, anatomical variant, and the lack of a firm endpoint on stress testing uh, when doing this. In terms of uh, further diagnosis, there, in terms of radiology, you can see these uh, stena lesions, or steiner lesions, I assume it's stena lesion. Um, this is where the ulnar collateral ligament is torn and it displaces proximally and superficially to the aponeurosis of the adductor pollicis muscle, which is attaching over the top of it normally. Uh, and so the aponeurosis becomes interposed between the ligament and its attachment point, which means that the ligament is unable to heal back down to where it has come from. Uh, and this is an indication of a surgical repair because these do not heal and lead to poor outcomes if they're left alone. Uh, 
So the way you can diagnose it is, is either on um, uh, clinical examination, you can feel a palpable mass, which is more, more prominent when there's a bony stenal lesion, uh, or, or you can be also seen on x-ray, uh, and then MRI is highly specific and sensitive for picking these up. So this is a pictorial representation, so the ulnar collateral ligament in blue underlying the aponeurosis of the adductor pollicis, and when it's torn, if the thumb is taken into extreme valgus, this proximal fragment can retract and flip back over the top of the adductor pollicis. And as you can see, that's not going to allow it to heal in that position. And so I just circled there with the, the stenal lesion. Uh, in terms of treatment for these uh, lesions, so um, if it's uh, an acute ulnar collateral ligament injury in a stable or a partial tear, uh, they can be managed non-operatively with four weeks of immobilization in a spike, a splint, or a cast with the um, interphalangeal joint free to allow for movement. If they're unstable injuries based on that, the diagnostic criteria that I just explained before or they're complete tears, then they should be surgically repaired in the acute stage. And this can be either with a, um, a repair of the mid-substance of the ligament um, with uh, some sutures or... And uh, it could also be repaired if it's a, a avulsion, so a bony avulsion or a distal avulsion with a suture anchor repair. There's some controversy about um, fixing avulsion fractures with no bony ligaments, so uh, sorry, no, no bony stenal lesions. So you could imagine if it's avulsed but it hasn't flicked back uh, past the aponeurosis, then it has a chance to potentially scar, scar that down and heal. And so it's controversial whether or not these should be fixed. Uh, so if it's a piece of bone that's been taken off and it's undisplaced, if it's not a true stenal lesion, then uh, if it's stable on stress testing, then it can be managed non-operatively. Uh, however, there have been variable outcomes described and there's some patients that get pain, painless and painful non-unions and there's some that have ongoing instability. Uh, in the literature, most of these actually reported as having minimal functional deficits and so even though they might not unite or they have some instability, they're still able to do everything they need to do. Uh, in terms of chronic injuries, so the gamekeeper's thumb, um, these are, you should only reconstruct these in the absence of significant metacarpal phalangeal joint osteoarthritis. Uh, and there's actually evidence to say that up to two years after the sort of uh, start of the injury, these can still be repaired by mobilizing the, the UCL fragment from the scar and then repairing it back down to the bone with anchors with uh, success as described in the literature. And, you can also do either dynamic or static procedures, so utilizing muscles um, as like sleeves to, um, to stabilize the thumb. Uh, you can use the adductor pollicis or the extensor pollicis brevis that have been described, or static procedures where uh, there's uh, tendon reconstructions, free tendon grafts to reconstruct the ligaments and provide stability. Uh, this is a um, some pictures of an unstable CMC joint and on the left-hand side on stress testing. And then when opened up, you can see that the probe is pointing to that stenal lesion um, that's flicked up underneath or superficial to the um, adductor pollicis aponeurosis. And then just a, a representation of the um, incision on the right-hand side that's used, so a lazy S incision. In terms of complications, I've split these just into general complications such as reduced grip, grip and pinch strength and reduced function due to the, the thumb dysfunction. Uh, and then post-traumatic osteoarthritis, pain and stiffness. That can be from any either non-surgically or surgically managed uh, base of thumb injury. Specifically with fractures, they can lead to malunion, non-union, and that, um, that uh, compensatory MCP joint hyperextension as well, and deformity. Uh, CMC joint dislocations and UCL injuries can obviously lead to recurrent instability, um, even with surgical um, stabilization. If managing these injuries surgically, then uh, there can be injury to the dorsal branches of the superficial radial nerve, which can lead to um, either a painful neuroma or paresthesia. Uh, if you're using KYs, obviously pin side infections and then failed repairs or reconstructions, uh, especially if patients going back to uh, activities involving high functional demand. So thanks very much for listening to that and happy to take any questions.